Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New Books and Economics, a podcast channel from the New Books Network. I'm Peter Lawrenson, a professor of economics at the University of San Francisco. My guest today is Professor Leah Bustan from Princeton University, where she is a professor of economics as well. She's also co-director of the Development of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her research lies at the intersection of economic history and labor economics and has been published in a number of prominent academic economics journals, including the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics, among others. Today, we're going to talk about her new book, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, co-authored with Professor Ron Abramitsky of Stanford University. This book takes their academic research on the economic history of immigration to America and presents it in a very accessible fashion, interwoven with stories of uh, individual people from uh, that they've met, from the history that they've read in their own lives, um, and highlighting its many implications for how we think about immigration today. The book is set to be released on May 31st and is available for pre-order now. Welcome, Leah. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's uh, great to have you on. Um, so is this your first interview about did, the book? We did one other interview, but you're catching me right at the beginning um, of what I hope is a coming out month for the book. Yeah, I, uh, I was excited when I looked online. I was like, oh, no, I actually managed to get to you before uh, before most everyone else. I saw I saw online that you're doing an event with Matt Iglesias in the fall. So I feel like I can say I scooped him. Um, or maybe I'm just the warm up for him, but, but either way, it's good. I love it. Um, so first, uh, how about you tell us about the, the kind of data that you use for your research, right? So immigration, I mean, there's got to be historians and lots of people have looked at this. So what did you do as economists that differs from what historians uh, have presumably already done? So you mentioned, Peter, that we have a lot of stories in our, in our book interwoven with the data. Um, and the data itself um, is almost like you can imagine us as curious grandchildren who go to try to reconstruct our family tree on a genealogy website like Ancestry.com. But we're doing this millions of times over. Um, So we're imagining that we want to reconstruct as many family trees from American history as possible. Um, In order to do this, uh, we're using um, historical census data. Um, So the census takes the temperature of the country every 10 years. And in theory, you should be able to connect people over time uh, from, let's say, the 1900 census to 1910 to 1920 and follow households and families. In our case, we're really interested in immigrant families. But of course, we also want to compare to uh, U.S. born families as well. So in the historical data, what we try to do is take census snapshots and turn them into what would be panel data, where we're following people over time and then following their kids as they leave home. And so it's not it's not officially built that way. The census just said there's there's this person living here at this place, but you can trace them by saying, well, they've got the same name or they have the right age and so forth. That's exactly right. When you're looking at the historical data, unfortunately, we don't have a unique ID number like a social security number that would allow us to be 100% sure that we're looking at the same person. So one of the real innovations of the work that we do is to try to build an algorithm uh, to follow people over time with what limited information we do have. Um, So we know first name and last name. We know age, which we can advance forward by 10 years for each census period. And we know either state of birth or country of birth. Um, And that's really it in terms of uh, what we would know that we think is unlikely to be changing decade by decade. Um, And so we use that information to try to figure out who's who. Okay. So if it's a relatively unique name, that's pretty straightforward. But if it's like John Smith from Chicago, then it must be tougher. 
Yeah. So in the work that underlies the book Streets of Gold, um, I think, you know, we have many more cases of of people who have more uncommon names um, than we do people who have common names. It's a bit hard to distinguish one John Smith from another. Um, In some new work that we're doing right now, so, um, you know, you can check back with us at the end of the summer, uh, we're trying to use extra information um, like spouse's name or kids' names or... um, county of residence um, to try to differentiate or break some ties. Uh, So to say John Smith, who's married to Martha, is more likely to be the John Smith we see married to Martha 10 years later um, than John Smith, who's married to Virginia or something like that. Um, So we've done some piloting with that, and certainly that can help break some ties. Uh, But there are some cautions there as well, because these are aspects of a person's life that are more subject to change. Um, You know, you might move from one location to another, um, your spouse might die, you might leave your parents' house. And so we feel like we're on really comfortable ground when we're just dealing with the few basic characteristics that we were just talking about. The nice thing is we're literally dealing with millions of records. Um, By 1940, there are almost 100 million people living in the U.S., And so even if we can't match everyone, we still are working with samples that are multiple millions large. Um, And so we truly have what we think of as the first big data about immigrants in the U.S., Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's great work. So you said it's from census data, but did you you also worked with Ancestry on this? Well, what Ancestry has right now um, is um, a wide range of historical records. So they have all of the census records that they've digitized. They have um, draft cards from World War One and World War Two. They have marriage records. Um, they they have voting registration. So they have almost everything you could imagine that was written down um, with people's names and information in the past. Um, so that's something that if you are a customer of Ancestry, you can pay you know, $29.99, you can get a subscription, and you can look up your own grandparents or great-grandparents. Um, Ancestry does not make all of that data available to researchers right now, um, but they do have a Um, a research agreement for the census data. Um, That's only a portion of what's up there on Ancestry, but that's what we have access to. Um, And that in and of itself is quite a lot to analyze. So we're primarily using um, census data that was digitized by Ancestry.com and other kind of partner companies, and then was um, shared back to researchers uh, to do projects like this. Yeah, well, that's great that they're willing to share it. I mean, there's, you know, there's so much... Uh, you know, data being generated or accumulated within the digital economy, but but since it's kind of their their competitive resource, they also are often very unwilling to share it or risk that anyone else might might get access to it or use it. Uh, so so it's really wonderful that I mean it is public data, but like you know, obviously the the effort of actually digitizing this all is is huge. So that's great that they're even willing to share this this major part of it, and, and certainly oh, I can see that's plenty to keep you busy. It's huge, and it's it's. Um, so valuable that they're willing to share. I mean, we tell a funny story about how this all came about in the book um, because initially um, we have to admit that we were scraping ancestry. Um, uh, And this was around 10 years ago now. um, And we got started um, just doing some piloting of trying to find immigrant families. And um, I think that our efforts um, sort of turn the dial at Ancestry, all of a sudden they said to themselves, wow, our product got really popular. You know, all of a sudden this month, someone is searching for like thousands and thousands of family members. And it turned out that all of that increase in popularity was really just us. Um, We had a couple of uh, accounts and looking up people and um, far more people than, you know, they were expecting. And so uh, my co-author, Ron, uh, got a phone call from the Ancestry lawyer um, right, ar- right around 10 years ago now saying, you know, cease and desist, like, because I think they were worried that we were trying to um, take their data and repackage it and resell it. Uh, and it's a very legitimate concern on their part because they put a huge amount of effort into digitizing it. Eventually, they figured out that we were just academic academics, um, interested in asking some research questions. And then with our interest, plus the interest of other teams, they've um, put together researcher agreements now, which is really an amazing resource. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful that you were able to work it out. I know. Yeah, I feel like, 
yeah, 10 years ago, like I think almost every, every PhD student I knew was like scraping something. <laughs> and so it's not surprising that, uh, that they're kind of onto us now and like trying to uh, figure out like, okay, which of these is, uh, you know, an appropriate, an appropriate use, um, and which of these, uh, which of these did need, did they need to block? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and our graduate students are, you know, working with social media data right now and that sort of thing. Um, and so I think there's increasingly ways of um, get, gaining access to this data in kind of um, uh, maybe more appropriate channels, let's just say. Um, mm -hmm. So that's also a nice, um, a nice change uh, from what was really the Wild West 10 years ago. Yeah, and I guess it's Hopefully it's a good thing that, uh, you know, sometimes we feel sad that like so many of our PhD students are, are going on to uh, get jobs in industry, but then uh, hopefully that also means that there's people there who who get what we're doing and, and know how to tell, you know, what's a serious request for, for research and what's what's not. And, and, you know, might be more more open to supporting that and explaining it to, to people from other backgrounds who don't really know what the heck we're up to. I think that's absolutely right. We've already seen that amongst our own students um, here at Princeton just over the past few cohorts. Um, the students who go into industry, um, they are really excited to partner again with some of our grad students and help them out. Um, and so, right, I do think there are more people on the uh, other side of the ledger, so to speak, who understand what research is all about, which is, is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so you've got this this big data, lots of uh, family trees and sort of bits of the life stories of, of so many people um, across the decades. Um, so now now let's talk about what you do with it. Um, so you you frame your book in terms of um, some widespread myths or misconceptions that people have about how. Um, about what immigration was like in the past and often you know this is important because it what they think about what happens in the past colors how they think about what's happening today so um, so let's lay them out and try to talk through them um, uh, as much as we can um, so I think the first one is that uh, in the past immigrants uh, succeeded really easily whereas today immigrants are kind of mired in poverty and dragging the rest of us down in some sense or at least themselves not succeeding. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was the first myth that we sought uh, to reevaluate. Um, and I think we have this sort of nostalgic view of the Ellis Island generation that somehow they were able to get rich quick. And this comes uh, from sort of triumphalist stories and from maybe the narrative we heard in high school history classes, but it also actually comes from the academic research. So it turns out that some of the earliest work that was done on uh, what we think of as the Ellis Island generation did find what looked like really rapid success. And this is um, a result that turns out to be faulty when you start probing it a little further. Um, and what happened was that scholars who began looking into this question only ever had access to data from a single census. So one point in time. Um, let's say they had data from 1970. Um, and then they would be comparing recent immigrant arrivals to immigrants who had come 30 or 40 years ago. So that would be immigrants who came in 1965 compared to immigrants who came in 1930. And they, by that sort of comparison, they'd say, wow, the immigrants who came in 1930 were doing much better. So it must be that immigrants can very quickly rise in America. Um, they were saying they were doing much better by 1970, or they were saying they d did much better in their first 10 years? By 1970. So that's the okay. thing, is that the first round of research was taking data from one time period and um, comparing very recent arrivals, someone who had been in the U.S. for less than five years, to very long-standing arrivals, someone who had been in the U.S. for 30 or 40 years, um, and said, wow, there's a lot of upward mobility for immigrants um, and it turns out that there was they were really comparing apples and oranges. If you think about who came to the U.S. in 1930, it was a lot of like German scientists who were fleeing the Nazi regime. Whereas if you think about who was coming to the U.S. in 1965, um, the border had just reopened and there was a lot of migration um, from Mexico, from Asia. So it was a totally different set of immigrants. Um, and so really this underscores how important it is to follow immigrants over time. We really want to follow the same set of people 
people and watch them as they spend more time in the U.S. Do they have more upward mobility and upward career success compared to the U.S. born of the same ages? I mean, of course, we all get more... um, earnings growth over the course of our career. Um, We have this kind of age earnings profile um, where we have um, some promotions and we have more responsibility at work and our pay goes up um, as we get older. Uh, And certainly that happens for immigrants too. Uh, But when we were following immigrants over time, we found a much more tempered story. Um, Immigrants did not move up faster than the U.S. born. They didn't have this really meteoric rise that it seemed to be the case in these earlier studies. In fact, immigrants from the Ellis Island generation looked like they were moving up at the same rate as immigrants today who might be coming from Mexico or Central America or different parts of Asia. There was nothing special about the European migrants from the Ellis Island period um, in terms of that first generation. So Rags to riches is not at all the way to think about immigrants now or immigrants in the past. Wait, so the the census, does the census have income data or how did you uh, figure out how rich someone was? Well, that's a really good point about the historical data. Um, Not until 1940 uh, did the census ask about individual income. So instead, we have to try to predict someone's income from information that we have about them. Primarily, what we know is their occupation Mm -hmm. and their state of residence or county of residence and their age. Um, And from those three things, we have a pretty good sense of what their income was likely to be. Um, But we don't know whether you were kind of the best paid carpenter in New Jersey who was 45 um, or whether you were the worst paid. So we don't have that kind of within occupation, um, within age variation that we would get later in the century. Um, But we can kind of dumb down the the newer data to to see what things would look like if we used this sort of occupation-based income prediction. Um, And we get very similar patterns, whether we have the real income data or um, uh, an occupation-based proxy. Okay, great. So so you're saying – so I think there were two things in what you were saying. So one is that, you know, obviously you can't compare, you know – how well is someone doing 50 years after their family arrived in the U.S. versus someone who, who just got here? Um, I think you also sort of suggested that there's different different waves may have had different characteristics. So there's kind of the initial, you know, the starting point of, you know, a PhD rocket scientist uh, from, uh, from Germany um, is going to be very different from the starting point of someone who, you know, just uh, was, you know, a uh, small time merchant in Vietnam and just, just fled in the seventies. So how do you, um, so, uh, yeah, how do those, I mean, I think that's part of why people and anxiety people have about immigrants. They feel like in, you know, the, the new immigrants are not like the, the same, I don't know, quality is the wrong word, but they would think of it as quality, you know, the same level of education, the same level of income as, as the old immigrants or something. So then that might, might change things. Um, yes. So I think the big difference between past and present is really the starting point um, that um, that immigrants from now, it's a little bit I want to put a caveat to say that it turns out that the studies that were comparing the immigrants from the 1930s to the immigrants from the 1960s, um, they were really looking at a very small and very selected group of immigrants. Um, there were not very many immigrants coming to the U.S. in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s because we had essentially restricted the border as of 1921. Um, So it turns out that the older studies I was mentioning were really cherry-picking a very self-selected and small group of immigrants um, for these kinds of comparisons. But that caveat aside, you're absolutely right that um, there are differences in initial starting point Uh, for different immigrant groups, depending on where they're coming from, and what kinds of skills and education and training they may have received in the home country. And so if we go back 100 years ago to the Ellis Island generation, many of those immigrants were coming from countries that were on par with the US in terms of economic development. So think about the UK and Germany, um, other parts of Western Europe, um, 
And those immigrants were already reasonably skilled compared to the U.S. born. And they started out at a, a relatively high level of pay. Um, there were also some immigrants in the past that were coming from poorer countries like Italy or Norway um, or Poland. And those immigrants were starting out with a lower level of pay. Um, but the level of pay today for immigrants from many of our poor sending countries is even substantially lower than that. Um, so one big difference that's happened over time is that the U.S. has opened up to the whole world rather than just to Europe. Um, and that does create a fair amount of anxiety. But what our research shows is that regardless of your starting point, immigrants are moving up at the same pace. So there's the same degree of earnings growth or earnings convergence now as there was in the past. Of course, if you start at a lower point and you have a nice rapid clip of convergence, you still aren't going to completely catch up to the U.S. born in one generation. Uh, but the trajectory is going in the right direction and is looks very similar to the trajectory in the past. So I think that gives a lot less um, scope for anxiety about first generation immigrants uh, for today. But that being said, and I think this is a really nice transition to our second myth, it really has always been the children of immigrants that are achieving most of the upward economic mobility um, that accrues to the immigrant population. Um, so whether we're talking about relatively um, uh, well, Im uh, immigrants coming from relatively high income you know, European countries in the past or immigrants coming from poor sending countries today, um, in both cases, uh, the pace of upward mobility for the immig immigrant generation itself is not that rapid. And where most of the mobility takes place is really with the kids. How about um, just because I grew up in California with a lot of uh, immigrant um, children in my classes and uh, like where, where's the dividing line? Because I feel like, you know, there's there's some of them. We sort of have this, you know, we say like, oh, you know, U.S. born versus not. But like there's there's plenty of them who were, you know, born in Vietnam or something and then came here at age five or age 10 um, you know, or, or in Mexico or wherever else. So, so where is the, I don't know if your data is, you know, we have a lot of data, so maybe you can like, wh where's the cutoff of when you look more like a first generation versus, uh, versus a children of immigrants? Well, the way that we break our data is basically, um, on birthplace. So if you, um, were born, um, in China or Vietnam, and you came when you to the U.S. when you were five, um, you're still classified as a first generation uh, immigrant to us. And um, if you were born in the U.S. Uh, at any point, whether your parents just arrived or whether your parents had arrived 20 years before, um, then you're classified as second generation. So it's really a generational um, divide, and there's going to be a number of kids growing up in the same household that could actually be, you know, in those two different generations, like an older child that was born abroad and a younger child that was born in the U.S. And from best we can see, the 1.5 generation, which is what sociologists call it, so people who came to the U.S. when they were very young, um, they uh, look uh, sort of halfway between um, the parent generation and um, the the child generation. Um, so if you're going to separate them out in the data, um, they don't look exactly the same as their younger siblings. Okay, yeah, I guess I was wondering if there was, if you had enough data actually sort of like, if there was a, a sharper cut point or if it's more uh, more of a continuum just going from, you know, from the one to one to the 1.5 to two, but it sounds like at least from what you have so far, it's more of a continuum. Well, and I should also clarify that um, the one the 1.5 generation actually do get grouped in with their siblings when we make claims about the children of immigrants. Because in that case, what we're interested in is what is the attribute of your parents? Were your parents born in the U.S.? Then you're um, a child of a U.S.-born household. Were your parents born abroad? 
then you're the child of an immigrant household, uh, regardless of when you yourself came uh, to the U.S. So when we're making statements about children of immigrants um, are really experiencing tremendous upward mobility, um, then that would include the children who um, come themselves um, when they're quite young, um, th which in a way um, makes our finding even more um, you know, fascinating and surprising because if the children who are born abroad and come when they're young are sort of halfway between their parents and their younger siblings, but we're including them in the mix when we're making statements about children of immigrants, then it means that the children of immigrants are doing all the better um, because we're including in that mix us uh, a group that is not as successful as their younger siblings. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's yeah. That's that's really uh, well. Anyway, it's, it's you know generally very, it's very very positive news, right? So so people may look around and you know partly because we have so many more immigrants um, these days, and especially I suppose if you're older, maybe there's more immigrants. You know, if people. I don't know, I guess over 50 for them, then they look around and they didn't grow up surrounded by immigrants because that they were uh, young before this wave. And so now most of the immigrants they see who are their age or who they've interacted with in their lives are much more likely to be uh, either sort of first or th I guess third or fourth generation. So they sort of, they, they're probably making the same mistake that the, you know, the earlier researchers did, right? They see, they see immigrants these days and they're people who are, you know, new to the U S and, you know, still struggling economically. And then they look around at people who immigrated back in the day and they see, oh, well, they're all, you know, they're all just like me, but with a different last name and they celebrate Christmas a little bit differently or have a different holiday, but like, you know, no big deal. Um, actually, that, that sort of leads into then uh, another um, issue you address. So there's a concern, I think even, um, you know, the, the famous political scientist, Sam Huntington um, at, uh, at Harvard had, had asserted that, you know, sure, even if immigrants succeed, that's one thing, but they're always going to be, you know, culturally different. They're not going to assimilate the way that, you know, now the Italians and the Poles and the Irish and the English all kind of get along and, and barely even, you know, we all get, you know, lumped together as white people, but like the, the new people, they, you know, will be forever different. So, so tell us what your research says about that, that uh, concern. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, as economists, we really started our project thinking about occupation and income, um, thinking about geography a little bit, like what cities do immigrants choose to live in. Um, and we really didn't start by thinking about cultural outcomes. But um, when when talking to you know family or friends or just people on the plane, um, and we talked about assimilation, people would say to us, well, okay, that's fine. Um, Immigrants are doing well economically, or at least their kids are doing really well economically. But are they really becoming Americans? Like that's what we think of when we think of assimilation. Um, and these days, I see immigrants who look really different from me, and I just worry about that. Um, so we wanted to bring some real data to that question as well. Um, and we wanted to come up with something that we could measure both in the past and today. Um, so there's a number of different ways to look at that question, and we tried to tackle um, a variety of them in the book. So things like who do immigrants marry? Do they marry other people from the home country or do they marry someone um, who is maybe U.S. born or maybe from another country of origin? Um, what kinds of neighborhoods do immigrants live in? Do they live with others from the home country or do they live in a more integrated neighborhood? Um and then one that we thought was really illuminating, which is what names do immigrants give for their, to their kids um, as they spend more time in the U.S.? Um, do they start out by giving their kids names that sound very much like the home country's set of names and then as time goes on, choose names that sound more American? Um, and what we found along all of these dimensions is that immigrants – do make substantial efforts to become American, and again, at very much the same pace in the past and the present. Um, and so we did not find complete convergence. So even by the end of an immigrant's life, they still engage in some behavior that looks different 
uh, from the behavior of the typical U.S. born. Um, the names that they pick are a little bit different, you know, even after spending 20 years in the U.S. But there's been a lot of convergence. There's a lot of uh, sort of attempting to uh, look more like, sound more like um, their neighbors and other American born um uh, friends or co-workers that they might meet as they spend more time in the U.S. So when they first arrive, they've got that, uh, they, they have some kind of funny name no one can pronounce. Um, but then, you know, they, I guess, I was gonna say, they, don't, they don't name their kids Peter anymore. So that, that name's totally gone out of style, but uh, they're, you know, going to name their kid Jaden or Caleb, just like everyone else and, and Emily um, after, after a couple generations. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, and I think that your point about name trends is is also really important. Like you can't just take a name like Peter and say, oh, this is once and for all American or it's once and for all, you know, European, like whether it might be Dutch or German or that sort of thing. Um, because names change a lot in their trends. And so we really needed to go to the data and have the data tell us whether a name is American sounding or not. And basically, we just counted up the number of people who have each given name um, who were born abroad versus born in the U.S. And we calculate the relative probability that someone is U.S. born if they have each name. And that can change a lot over time. So the Peters today um, might be very U.S. born and the Peters in the past might be very European born. And, and we are able to kind of pick up those trends. So that's the types of names that immigrant parents might reach for today to really prove to themselves and to um, their kids, friends and teachers that their kid really belongs in America might be very different now. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah, actually, just my something when I when I started, you know, having kids, I of course, as an economist, when I, once I found that there was data about this, I was fascinated, and so looked into just at a very superficial level the uh, social security records and um, and saw some great descriptions of how you know different names have have risen and fallen, um, like what we named one of our kids Max, which peaked in like the 1920s because that was like. Uh, the name of, and but it peaked in the 1920s and then it was like, it declined because like that was the name of your immigrant grandpa um, from, you know, from the old country in Europe. And it sounded like a crusty immigrant grandpa, but then it sort of had a resurgence um, in, uh, in the late nineties and early two thousands. Cause it's, I guess, common in, I don't know, a lot of storybooks or, or maybe, you know, crusty immigrant grandpa just kind of sounds, sounds sort of fun as a, you know, it sounds sort of fun in memory versus like the person being right there now. So it kind of, Re, re-emerged. And so there is, it does seem like it's, it's great that you can actually do that with data because certainly coming at it with my preconceptions of like, what is a typical, uh, you know, mainstream U.S. born American name um, that, that certainly has changed dramatically over time. Yep, that's exactly right. And in this um, case, we actually developed our hypothesis um, from thinking about our own lives. And in particular, in thinking about my co-author, Ron, who himself is an immigrant and has three kids. So um, he found with kid one and kid two that uh, people were having a hard time pronouncing the names that he chose. And he even tried to choose names that he thought would be easy. They only have a few letters. They're very short, but people weren't really understanding what was going on. So um, for his third kid, he picked a name that is um, very uh, American sounding and um, very easy to pronounce and everyone gets it. And so he feels like he learned more about American culture as he spent more time here. Um, and it was exactly that experience um, of thinking about his own kids um, that led us to investigate this hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I guess it's a slight, slight tangent, but that's, you know, another indication of, you know, we're all trying to make the uh, discipline of economics have people from more diverse backgrounds. And you can see right there, just, you know, an example of uh, how, how these different personal experiences can lead you to, to interesting research topics that are not something that you would, you would draw out of some, uh, some academic literature. Yeah, this was a really interesting uh, opportunity for us. Um, uh, in writing the book to um, 
connect some of the hypotheses to um, events in our own family's lives. And you're absolutely right. Each one of us has our own story. And so we come at the data and at the world um, uh, with a different set of questions in mind. Um, this is a good example of that. Okay. So um, then I guess in terms of the myths, I think the, the third major one that you hit is that uh, it's almost, it's a little bit the opposite, but like, you know, one is that like, they're all poor and they're all going to be on welfare and they're all going to be in like isolated communities that never, never look like the rest of us. And then I guess the other is that they're going to take all of our jobs, um, and, and make things worse for, for, uh, not native, but for, for American born, uh, citizens. So, so tell us what the data says about that. Um, so, uh, in this section of the book, we're drawing a little bit on our own research, as we've been doing um, uh, in the work we've been talking about so far, as well as um, we really relied heavily on work that's been happening all around the profession um, in this section. Um, so for ourselves, we had studied the 1921 border closure um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so up until 1921, essentially any... Uh, immigrant from Europe who wanted to come to the U.S. could very easily do so. If you have this image in your mind of the Ellis Island waiting room with these long benches and in some cases, thousands of immigrants coming in through Ellis Island on a daily basis. And then suddenly that just stops. Um, from around a million immigrants a year, the U.S. shut down to only 150,000 immigrants a year. So we thought this is a really interesting opportunity to ask about um, what happens to the U.S. born. Um, you know, if the hypothesis is, well, if only immigrants would stop coming to the U.S., then there would be more jobs available for people locally, um, then we should see that kind of activity going on in 1921. Um, and the issue here is that it's such a big policy that it's kind of hard to get traction on um, identification. You know, um, you have... Uh, basically a time series with a lot of immigrants coming in and then suddenly not so many immigrants coming in. Um, so we tried to cut the country into areas that were more or less affected by this policy uh, because the policy was not universal. It actually kept open quite a lot of spots for Western Europeans, so for Brits and Irish and Germans, and really cracked down on entry for Southern and Eastern Europe. And then there were some locations, uh, some cities, but also some rural areas that had large Southern and Eastern European communities. And then those communities just simply stopped receiving new inflow. Um, and we could compare those places to, you know, some place nearby that had a lot of immigrants as well, but those immigrants were from Western Europe. Um, and um, we started with just that occupation-based income measure that we were talking about earlier, um, looking at the locals who were in those affected cities or affected rural areas, and we found just a surprising zero. You know, really, there was no benefit, it seemed, to the local uh, residents who were U.S. born. And we tried to drill down on what was going on. And what seems to be happening is that firms just have a lot of alternative um, sources of input that they can turn to. Um, it's not like the two options they have are, OK, we have U European born immigrants or we have US born uh, locals. And if we can't use the European immigrants, we'll just turn to the guy next door. Um, so it turned out that there were um, other immigrant groups they could turn to, which included Mexicans and Canadians. Um, there were a lot of internal migrants that moved within the U.S. Uh, to take jobs. Um, and then in some places, there was also a lot of substitution to um, new machines, so to capital. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting lesson for today. I think the menu of inputs are, are probably different today. But um, if it weren't for immigrants coming in, um, there might be more outsourcing. They, there might be more automation. Um, and so this gives us a sense of you know, why the benefits don't immediately accrue to locals. Um, now, the one thing about the 1920s that's really different is that um, – Immigrants that were coming in at the time uh, looked reasonably similar to the U.S. born. Um, and so 
you would think of them as being pretty substitutable, uh, whereas today immigrants are actually quite different from the U.S. born. And so I think, you know, all the more so today, um, there's reason to suspect that immigrants probably aren't really taking the jobs of the U.S. born. Um, and this for this section, we were really uh, leaning on work that's been done by many of our colleagues, you know, in labor economics, people working on the modern data. Uh, but first of all, a lot of immigrants today are high skilled. Um, you know, they have PhDs, they're working in tech, um, they're working in science, and they're doing things that may even um, create jobs uh, for Americans. Um, and then for those who are low skilled, um, who are working in agriculture or childcare um, or landscaping or restaurant work, um, they're actually filling in a whole set of the skill distribution that doesn't have a lot of coverage uh, from the U.S. born. Um, and so um, all the more so today, uh, we think that, you know, immigration is not really a zero sum. Great. And I know that's, you know, that's very much consistent with, uh, yeah, a large, large body of research that we don't have to get into. Um, so I think were those, uh, were th are there any other big myths that you, um, would like to talk about, or was that the main three? So those are the main three. Um, but I do just want to underscore, you know, as we're getting to the end of our conversation, um, you know, how strikingly similar the success of uh, the second generation, the children of immigrants were um, in the past and the present. So, you know, when we're thinking back to the Ellis Island generation, which to me would be like my great grandparents and my grandfather, um, I remember my grandfather as being pretty successful, um, but he's the child of immigrants. He's not the immigrant himself. And so I think we, when we go back that far into history, we often kind of skip a generation, right? So a lot of the success that we attribute to the Ellis Island generation is really their kids. And that we can see quite clearly in the census data where we follow a kid or, you know, millions of kids from childhood households into adulthood. There we can follow them to 1940s. So we actually have income information for them. And we can place the children of immigrants into the income distribution. And we can see that they're doing um, very well, uh, even if they're being raised at like the 25th percentile of the income distribution. They're moving up above the median and they're doing so more readily than the children of U.S. born. But, you know, I really did not expect the same level of success today. Um, and that's the piece of the research that we've done that really blew me away the most is how strikingly similar that pattern looks for the children of immigrants today. So there's still, so contrary to what, what people are thinking, that they're still, uh, they're still striving and, uh, and getting ahead just as well as, uh, as any previous generations. Exactly. You know, so it's always the parent generation that's pretty slow out of the gate. And for today, that will mean, you know, parents that have pretty low income given the set of countries of origin. Um, but the children, despite coming from um, backgrounds where the parents are coming from poor countries, they're really able to move up above the median um, and do so more so than uh, the children of similar uh U.S. born families, you know, so if we're actually able to compare apples to apples and we have um, U.S. born families um, also, let's say at the 25th percentile, uh, the children of immigrant families are are doing better um, and v at like just amazingly similar um, uh, rate um, and degree uh, to the past. Wow, that's all. That's all really optimistic news, and it, so it's great that you've you've written this book to sort of uh, bring these um, this this learning to uh, to a broader audience. Um, is uh, what would be sort of your your I mean, aside from these these facts about things, what do you take as the implications of this for for public policy, or what are things you wish you that um, uh, policymakers might do differently, or at least rethink in in light of the the findings of your research? The main um, implication, we think, um, is to lead with optimism, actually. Um, uh, so we find the immigration policy debate these days uh, to be very defensive. Um, often there is a focus on um, the fact that there's an immigration crisis or that there's a crisis at the southern border. Um, it will be usually uh, the Republicans who are calling attention to immigration and in, an, in a negative way. Um, and then if we ever hear about immigration from 
uh, the other side from Democrats, it's usually a sort of running defense um, and saying, oh, it's not as bad as all of that. Don't worry. We're on top of it. Um, but really, uh, it's I have a hard time thinking of of anyone um, who's really out there in public life right now um, emphasizing how much immigrants contribute um, and how some of the groups that we fear um, might not be following this path um, are actually doing so uh, very successfully um, and are taking um, efforts to become American and doing so successfully, really integrating into communities. Um, and so um, I just would encourage uh, people who are in public life and in public policy, whether it's at the local level or at the national level, um, to take this optimistic message to heart. Great. Well, that's, I think, a, a wonderful message to end with. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming on. Thank you for your research and for um, sharing uh, sharing the research in in the book. Um, again, I'll, uh, I'll read the name again so people know it. It's uh, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. Um, from Public Affairs Books with Ron Abramitsky and Leah Bustan, and uh, coming out at the end of the month, right? Coming out May 31st. May 31st. Thank you so much for this conversation, Peter. It was really excellent. It was a pleasure.